Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Masi Bioservices Monitoring Best Practices webinar. We're really happy you could join us here today. Uh, I just want to mention to you before we start, if you take a look in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you will see an arrow in a red box. You can click on that and it will open a control where you will be able to enter questions for our panelists. So these questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So right now, I would like to start by introducing our panelists. We have George Biro, who is our monitoring product manager. We have John Masiello, who is the co-founder of Masi, as well as our executive vice president. And we also have Alan Leo, who is the monitoring systems sales manager. So now I'm going to turn it over to George Biro, and he is going to start with the presentation. Thank you, George. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is George Biro. I'm Massey's Monitoring Systems Product Manager. For the last five years, I've had the pleasure of traveling the nation, installing, validating, maintaining, uh, tech supporting monitoring systems and recommending to customers and businesses how best to use the applications they have and hardware that is available to do the job of monitoring. Hi, and I'm John Masiello. I've been involved in monitoring systems since the 80s. Uh, in uh, pharma, biotech, med device, and a number of different industries uh, involved with facilities, stability, uh, and utilizing uh, pretty much wireless back in the, uh, wired back in the day, wireless most recently, for the last 15 years, and uh, excited to be able to share best practices with you. My name is Alan Leo. I'm the uh, monitoring system sales manager here at Massey. I've been involved in sales for over 20 years now. I've traveled the world, um, and I have to tell you, we have over 70 plus years of experience in monitoring behind us here at Massey. So the experience is great. Thanks, guys. So um, right now we're going to, before we dive in, open it up to a quick poll. Thank you, George. So the poll, first poll question is, what brought you here today? So we're going to let the audience take a moment and answer that. And we still have some answers coming in. Okay, so it looks like, George, we have 87% said that they're looking to stay up to date with monitoring best practices. And 13% said that they were actually in need of a monitoring system and looking for advice. Okay, well, right, right place to be then. So um, I'm gonna guess that a bunch of people who are tuning in already know their need for why they're monitoring and uh, it's going to come as no surprise to anybody that you know these industries and businesses that we're in don't monitor for fun uh, we have to uh, and that's due to regulatory requirements and uh, the most common use uh, of monitoring is in industries that deal with drug and food products and that's because we have to maintain a record that they have been stored in the correct conditions so this presentation today will mainly revolve around storage conditions, temperature, humidity, and the like, um, and, and monitoring of that, providing those, uh, those records, those much needed records that we're required to do. So this affects even manufacturers, it's a, it affects uh, warehousing, supply chain, uh, all the way down to retail uh, and pharmacies. So just to name a few, um, for supply chain, the, the prevalent one is USP 36, Chapter 1079. Uh, we have the Food Safety and Modernization Act. So those are both dealing with, um, with supply chain. And uh, another big one is 21 CFR Part 203 by FDA guidance. And that's, that states all manufacturers, distributors, and representatives must store drugs under conditions that maintain stability. Okay, so we have to do it. Uh, and we have to have a record of that. That makes sense. And that's where the monitoring systems come into play. 
And of course, having a record is needed and fantastic, but along with that, electronic systems give us the ability to do alarming, uh, which is the second half of it, really. And for alarm capabilities, I'll, I'll throw that over to Alan. Alan? Thanks, George. Uh, electronic systems provide the much needed capability of remote alarming. This is used to safeguard product integrity and alert product owners to out of spec conditions or excursions. This capability gives staff time to react before product is compromised or make sure the customers do not receive and use unsafe goods. There is not a lot of use in having a system that can record out of tolerance conditions but not alert you in time to avoid disaster. Now we're going to go out into stability studies, John. Sure. With which is uh, the, uh, for, for both food and for pharmaceutical, biotech, and med devices. Okay. And then, of course, for med devices, you have aging studies uh, where you have to know how long they're going to last. How long can you keep them on the shelf? Food, how long is the product going to be stored on the shelf? How long is it going to be good? You know, the expiration dates on, on all different types of products. So in order to know what the expirations are, you have to have stability testing, stability studies to be able to uh, be able to monitor very closely all the conditions because that is the record that is going to be stored and you determine how long the product is, is being able to be stored at these conditions or how long out of these conditions. They have accelerated testing for each different condition. So that's why it's important. So we record it. We recorded the, every single area of it from whether it be temperature, humidity, whatever the requirements are. It could be light, it could be you know, all different aspects of it. And once you have all that data, then that is what you refer back to in the case that it's a condition, or out of condition. And right. Then we get to the supply chain management, George. Well, thank you. So uh, with supply chain management specifically, that is actually... Um, newer and adequate storage condition monitoring in supply chain is a more recent development than at the manufacturing facilities and retail locations so uh, chart recorders and daily readings from thermometers have been around for a very very long time but due to technological advancements and uh, the regulations following in kind um, we have better capability to actually monitor in supply chain so in the past there had to be a lot of assumptions made and worst case scenario testing was used to establish the parameters that would define what is considered a safe shipment of goods. Uh, this ultra conservative approach was wasteful in that it doesn't come close to tracking the reality and nuances of every individual shipment. Nowadays, monitoring the conditions throughout the entire supply, ch supply chain is not only easy, but affordable and with many options. So monitoring conditions that were previously reserved for fragile stationary systems that really weren't meant for use outside the lab can actually now be found in the back of a truck, for instance. And uh, a person looking into supply chain and transport monitoring can find systems that track temperature for an individual box uh, and require USB download, all the way to systems that provide real-time live data and live alarms with even GPS coordinates, for instance. Um, which is obviously quite the advancement from the uh, the small disposables um, to now. So thanks to these modern systems, the task of supply chain monitoring is much easier and more accurate than ever before. And this relaxes the testing needed to justify safe transport and provides a much more tailored approach to a, a company's actual operations. Um, and obviously when the material gets to where it's going, it needs to be stored with the same type of security and uh, conditions that it was transported in. And John, would you speak to the storage conditions? Absolutely. Well, we have re records. Records of, is, is of the is of, of, uh, utmost concern. So what was the condition? How was it stored in? So while we have all those all that data recorded, logged, uh, and how you access it, how you have your, your, your values um, determined by that, right? You decide that, uh, for example, a product is supposed to be stored in refrigerated conditions, two to eight degrees. Right? That's what was determined. That was determined based on the previous discussion on the stability studies. It was determined that you cannot freeze it. Maybe in the case of vaccines, you cannot freeze it. So they've tried freezing. It says that the, that, may, that it loses the the, if it's the effectiveness of the, the product. So it has to be two to eight. So they determined in the stability, can it go up to what temperature? 
15 degrees. There's some value. So what happens is USP, you know, United States uh, Pharmacopoeia decided with, with all with people within the, con within the country, within the world, the SMEs to say, well, how do we come up with a condition? Or how do we come up with a way of determining if, if conditions are acceptable? So in USP, they have things that say that, well, on a two to eight degrees product, if it was in the condition or it was out of condition for a period of time, then the condition's fine, two to eight, simple as that. Alarm limit, notification, you good. If it goes out of that, well, how long is it acceptable? So as long as you have 24 hours of data, you can run your mean kinetic temperature study, or your data calculation, you can determine that result for a short period of time, it did not go over 15 degrees, life is good. Your product is acceptable based off the USP, which is what a lot of the stability studies and stuff have worked and have been testing for that. But you have to have your, all your data, you have to be able to look at it and, and, and consistently calibrate it, all that, to be able to have very good information to make your determination, is it acceptable? Thanks, John. And, and to build on that, it's not going to come a, to a surprise to, uh, to anyone that when you look at like a bottle of pills that you buy, it'll say what you need to store it at. That's the same conditions that uh, that from manufacturer all the way down to the retail has had to adhere to. And they actually have to do it much more than, you know, the, the consumer that puts it in a medicine cabinet and who knows what happens there. But uh, that's everything that... Um, goes into that. And uh, when it comes to consumer safety and eliminating waste, uh, I'll toss it over to Alan. So thank you, George. Uh, the bottom line is, is consumer safety. The regulations that many industries adhere to have been made with that in mind. Many have been made as a result of incorrect storage and people getting neg negatively affected. Additionally, monitoring is done to protect a company's assets. Detecting an incoming failure for a chamber full of expensive product can easily save a company millions, not only for the value of the product, but the labor surrounding that type of a failure as well. Right. And where it can get really neat with uh, eliminating waste is when a company will actually decide to monitor more than just what regulations require them to. And that's for more performance indicators and saving time on operations and uh, being ahead of the game. So eliminating waste can not only be done just as, as a required thing, but you know, on the offensive as well. And uh, before we advance on to the next slide, uh, I'm going to throw it open to another poll again. Lisa? Thank you, George. I'll run that poll question. And the question is, what is your primary concern with selecting a monitoring system? And we'll give the audience a moment to answer. All right, looks like we have a good number here. We're gonna close the poll. And the answers, George, um, overwhelmingly, 64% shows all of the above, which would be ease of use, security, and data accuracy and reliability. And then 32% are most concerned with data accuracy and reliability. And then 5% with ease of use. Right, yep. Um, all good things and good to have all of those answered uh, and be keenly aware of what you're looking for when you're looking into new monitoring systems. And, and with that, we will uh, we'll talk about selecting a system um, and, and how to actually ask the correct questions to get the answers you're looking for for those concerns. So when you're, when you're in need of monitoring, uh, analyze your situation and, and unique requirements. So you might find yourself already having an environmental monitoring system somewhere in your facility or a building management system somewhere. Can you use that? Does it do the job? Is it too old? Is it running on old software? Um, if you can use that, you know, you're in luck. You might be able to do something much faster. But we do find that systems that are older are easier to replace than actually keep you know, running along, limping. And building management systems uh, don't do the regulatory side of monitoring nearly as well as an actual dedicated monitoring system that's made with that in mind does. Um, so uh, if you're looking for a new system, one of the main considerations to make is wired versus wireless monitoring systems. 
So wired systems commonly have the fastest data collection rates, but are very expensive and extremely laborious to install. Take quite some time. It's a lot of running wires. And maintenance tends to be expensive and labor intensive as well. So wireless systems are dependent on nodes, which actually could act as a single point of failure for many chambers. Because for instance, a freezer farm in one room would have one node. And if that were to go down for whatever reason, you lose all the data for those chambers. Um, so wireless systems are less expensive and much easier to install. Due to the fact that each transmitter can act as its own independent node, reliability is increased for the overall system. This also makes scalability easier as you can quickly, inexpensively, uh, inexpensively add one, two, three transmitters to an existing system, for instance. Uh, this is very much the case for including additional facilities for perhaps throughout the country or world, uh, or even just a far off area in the same facility. So uh, what's good about the wireless systems there is that um, that could drive down costs and make scalability easier. Uh, but if you are looking into uh, those systems, you have to consider the types of wireless protocols. They're, the common ones, of course, are Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and then radio frequencies. So Wi-Fi is the most prevalent right now, um, but that's not a, actually the best thing. Uh, just because it's the most common doesn't make it the best, obviously. Uh, Wi-Fi is prone to poor range, um, and it is quickly affected by having objects or walls uh, in between transmitters and the receivers. Uh, also, uh, both food and drug product is, you know, very much dealing with biologics and liquids. And Wi-Fi, which is using 2.4 gigahertz, is actually the resonant uh, frequency of water itself. So many liquids, the majority of liquids out there in warehouses or in labs, are actually one of the biggest interference causers for Wi-Fi monitoring. And Bluetooth uh, doesn't have that problem, but it's even more low range. Uh, and kind of like with Wi-Fi, with Bluetooth, if you have a receiver like so frequently throughout your facilities, at what point are you really doing wireless monitoring? Uh, radio, which uses the same concepts, but uh, can use different radio frequencies. They, the radio, depending on what frequency you're on, you should ask these questions. Uh, what is the range that I can get? Uh, like, What is the common drop-off? Uh, you could choose radio frequencies if the system comes with it that can get hundreds of meters uh, and beyond, and they don't fall out of favor because with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you might run the risk of having your receivers uh, age in the protocol they use. Uh, people here might be familiar with their own home Wi-Fi routers, all of a sudden just not working so good anymore. It's actually because the protocol is being retired. If you can get a system that has a locked-in radio frequency that's FCC approved, you actually are kind of future-proofing your system there. So beyond that, um, you have long-term costs to um, think about as well, in addition to functional specs. So when you're looking at functional specs, you should take several things into account. What is your minimum data collection rate? And that's going to be a key decider between a wired system and a wireless system. Uh, you don't need to pay through the nose, for instance, for a wired system if you actually are fine with having uh, data collection rates that are one minute, for instance, or, or even more. How many concurrent users can you have on a system at one time? Uh, surprisingly, that's a question you need to ask. How is data backups handled? It's very important to make sure that your data is protected. And do you need automated reporting? If everything's manual, that's not so great. You, you don't really want to be doing a pull system. You'd rather have a push system that's actually doing the work for you. You want to forget about it if it's working well and just get the data and alarms you need in your inboxes. So, is receiving alarms by email adequate or do you need alarms to reach people on, on mobile devices? And speaking of which, do you need people to log in with their phones? It's a good idea to have an understanding when searching for a system of these questions. Knowing what you need is the best way to ensure that you don't underbuy and end up with a low quality system that doesn't do the job or overbuy and pay way too much for a system that has too many bells and whistles that you really don't need. So knowing what you're looking for is the best way to actually pick the best system for you, and that's where you find value. Um, on, on that topic, for the long-term cost, an extremely important and all too often overlooked aspect of monitoring systems really is the long-term cost. The price at purchase can be deceiving. Areas to look at regarding cost are several. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, scalability. 
ideally expanding your monitoring system to other areas, chambers, or facilities should be cheaper and easier than the initial deployment and search process for the monitoring system, especially if quantities are similar. So for maintenance, some systems actually come with such expensive support contracts that you could essentially be buying a brand new system every couple of years. Be on the lookout for that because that's something that usually comes on the back end of acquiring a monitoring system. And ask yourself, why would the support contract be so expensive and so highly re recommended if the system's really reliable? So for batteries, which is obviously much more common with a wireless systems, how often must the batteries be changed? Because that cost, which is you know hard to put on paper, that adds up quite quickly, especially if you're trying to be proactive to, to do what you need to do in a battery's lifetime. The cost of batteries, as we know from our personal lives, uh, are is expensive and it's time consuming to change out. So um, if the battery life is yearly or less, just be aware that you're gonna be spending a lot of money and a lot of hassle on batteries. Another recurring cost is calibrations. So just like you know, having a monitor system, we need to do calibrations. It's what ensures our system is actually recording what we want it to be recording accurately. Um, the most common calibration frequency is annual. So things to consider here is can your system, uh, with your system's calibrations, does a technician need to be assigned to doing this for days on end? Uh, do you need to fly someone out to your facility? Some wireless systems, modern ones, offer the simplicity of swapping calibrated probes to avoid these truly large expenses. Uh, labor as well, and this is labor is the chief amongst everything for the unforeseen costs, is just labor spent in-house. It is sadly common for end users having purchased a low quality system to find themselves having to troubleshoot it for hours a week or just try to make it do what it's supposed to do or what they want it to do. And if they don't spend that time, well, the monitoring system is useless. And you're, after acquiring a new one, you're probably stuck with it for a couple of years. So this time can add up very quickly and sap away uh, productive needed work elsewhere. And uh, on that note, once again, with the batteries, beyond the cost of the batteries itself, it can be really troublesome, uh, bothersome, and time consuming to have a worker changing out batteries for days on end. Uh, moving down the list, we'll, we'll get on to reliability. And Alan, could you speak to that, please? Thanks, George. Uh, given the nature of monitoring, we understand that reliability is the most important feature of a system. If the system doesn't work right or has downtime, it needs to be replaced. Some of the legacy systems out there, we know have some reliability issues, um, and some of the newer systems don't have that. And you'll you'll see that as uh, as this discussion goes on. Some of the Fallback modes is another component of selecting a system. For truly, for a truly reliable monitoring system, the fallback mode is one of the most important aspects. When the power or network goes out due to scheduled maintenance of a facility or perhaps a bad storm that passed through, how your system responds to this is key. Each node should have a backup battery to continue data collection during this period. This is where the wireless systems have an advantage as trans transmitters can frequently run for months in the state. If all goes well and data collection continues through the down period, the next important step is recovery. It is highly recommended to select a system that can automatically detect the network has been restored and upload its data automatically. This requires what is called bi-directional communication, which should be a must on your list of requirements. It is not uncommon, surprisingly, for some systems to re require a technician to download data from each node individually, which can take some time. Additionally, the system should back check your data and generate the alarms for excursions during the downtime. If it does not do this automatically, it would have to be done manually. This is still better than wired systems, which would have collected no data or reduced data during an extended failure state. All true. So one of the newer considerations that we get to make when selecting a new system is uh, cloud services versus locally installed data storage. So um, industries, well, industries and businesses uh, should be making that choice because it's, a, it's an important one now. Previously, there was no choice and a locally installed system, be it on a server or a PC at your site, was the only way to go. With the advent of cloud-based computing and the new choice of cloud-based monitoring along with it, uh, companies have been naturally cautious about the new technology and the nebulous vague term cloud didn't really help anything. But over the past few years, there has been a massive shift of the biggest to the smallest companies surging to move to the cloud to take advantage of the better costs, better scalability, and reliability. 
really the only sticking point where companies prefer a local system is due to lingering security concerns and the preference to have data at site. So as long as your cloud system uh, you choose can adequately export reports, data, and alarms, you should be able to make an educated risk-based decision on whether or not having data stored right at your site is worth the extra cost. And an important thing to ask too is like, who, who is storing the data? What is the cloud provider? What is the data storage provider? Uh, and the most common ones for that are Microsoft Azure, um, no surprise there, and Amazon AWS. So the only thing there is you wanna make sure that it's being stored, your data is being stored somewhere reliable and not someone's basement server in someone's basement, for instance, or garage. So um, moving on, John, would you be able to speak to um, a validation of these systems? John, I believe you're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. So no the question is, to validate or not to validate, right? So in the food industry, you know, you want to qualify something. You want to make sure that it works. You know, just as an HVAC or something else. You go through, you make sure it does what it does. You get the points in. Qualification, calibration, you know, those are some of the things that, you know, depending on the industry or what the sector, okay, and the pharmaceutical, of course, you need to validate, you know, and to what level. So if it's a non-GMP requirement, you know, again, quantify it. Maybe a checklist, a, 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 an adequate checklist to say it's installed, that sensor is in the right location, it's it's tra it's transmitting the data, it's collecting it, the report looks fine, you know, really simple. But in a GMP environment or a GXP environment, you need to document, you need to have proof. So it's kind of like a 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of the, the, it's documentation, 20% is actually doing the work because you need to have the proof that record that you did all the tests. So when it comes to the GMP or GXP, one of the things you want to do is you want to leverage the documentation from the manufacturer on the equipment. Okay, so that's really important. You get that information. They have qualified it or quantified it if this is required. That says they've, they've tested it and developed the system, right? Not once they do that. So you leverage that information, you leverage that report for what you're going to be doing. So, and the other component is, is what you want to do is you want to get, I'm going to say, the protocol that the manufacturer offers and provides. And then you can look at it. You can bring it in. You can have your team members determine, is that appropriate? Or is that a good template? Or is that just inappropriate? You know, we've seen some that were two pages, one to two pages long. And it's a checklist. So maybe it's appropriate for uh, commissioning or something. But sometimes they may be 100 pages or 90 pages or something like that. And maybe it's a, maybe it's too much wasted time of signing and initializing. But what you can do is you can actually take it and take it as a template, formulate it to meet your needs and look like your company protocol if you put it together. And it can save you a tremendous amount of time. Okay, so that that would be something you look forward to. Ask the manufacturer, ask the, and be able to, to leverage that information to save you a tremendous amount of time in getting and getting springboarded into into success. Now there are some regulations, okay, or some not necessarily regulations, but um, some requirements or some uh, some of uh, areas that you can look at, which would be GAMP five, the ISP, that's the current one or Annex 11, okay? And these both outline the need for process qualification or checking and doing things, okay? And that's at a higher level, okay? So if you do need a validation, you look for that. You need to utilize those as guidelines to be able to be successful in your, your, your venture, okay? And then, um, and then uh, let me see, if you need uh, any other types of requirements, uh, you, you actually, your, your end user requirements, you put that into the protocol to be able to you meet your required needs. And, and of course, another thing to consider for the equipment or the software component of it is 21 CFR Power Level Compliance. Okay. For the food industry, not, a, not, a, not important, not a necessary. Again, it's, it's one of those things you, but for the pharmaceutical requirement, it's, 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 it's critical to have it. It's electronic records, you know, signatures, all things like that. Now, an important component to look at when you are looking for a monitoring system, there are a tremendous amount of companies out there, a phenomenal amount of companies out there that are small, 
it may be virtual, it may be you know, non-GMP, research and development, what have you, but ultimately, ultimately, consider that you may end up somewhere along the way considering being a GLP, good laboratory practice, maybe eventually GMP is considering, right? So when you're considering a monitoring system, now that it's wireless, it's remote, it's movable, it's flexible, it's, it's, it, it, it's the, 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 everything that you would desire versus a wired system that we used to be ankle to brace to with this wireless system and the flexibility, consider can that system you have be utilized for non-GMP, simple install, it works. Can it be converted? Can it be simply just create a protocol to execute to then be able to utilize for a GMP or a GLP system? Imagine the flexibility go from non-GMP to GMP, to GMP with the same system that you've invested in. That's, uh, that's something to consider because small virtual companies eventually get acquired or eventually get to the next stages in that amongst themselves, they're in the next levels of, of, uh, of acceptance and in, in, in stages and they need to increase their, their, um, you know, their compliance. Well, if you already have the infrastructure and it's just a matter of creating the protocol to be able to execute to say, now I'm ready to roll and you're comfortable and you have the GMP documentation, that's something to think about. Right, right, and that's, that's a good point, John. And so that's that's the question to ask. Even if you don't need it right then, is it validatable in case I do need it? And if the answer is yes and you don't need it, good. You, you'll be able to take advantage of that when the time comes. And you actually get to know that it's just made with that in mind, which will mean that it's a higher quality system. Mm -hmm. So for how many sensors do you need for your system, this really depends on your use case as much uh, as is everything else with monitoring systems. When it comes to reach in the storage chambers, like a refrigerator or an incubator, the most common thing is to have one sensor per chamber or enough to cover all monitored parameters. For monitoring warehouses or rooms, then the number of sensors per area can increase proportionately with size. For large warehouse areas, which is commonly touch exterior walls and ceilings, you really have to develop a rationale for where your sensors are placed. It's whimsical to think that placing one sensor in the center of a 600,000 square foot warehouse provides monitoring at all. Uh, what has been industry standard for quite some time now is to do a thermal mapping of your warehouse. Uh, and for anyone who actually joined the, um, the warehouse mapping uh, webinar we did a couple weeks ago, it was a good one, I recommend it. But uh, on that topic, um, it, yeah, it's been standard to, to do those warehouse mappings. Uh, and sometimes with relative humidity, in addition to temperature for reference as well, um, not always a requirement, but uh, by bringing in that large amount of sensors to run a study in both summer and winter, you've determined the thermal properties of your warehouse or large storage room in the worst case scenarios. With this data, you can make a data-driven decision as to where your hot spots and cold spots are for both seasons. And by making sure you have sensors in these locations at a minimum provides you with a sound starting point. From there, you have the ability to distribute sensors intelligently throughout the warehouse to a much lesser degree than what was needed for the mapping to ensure that you are getting full enough picture of your warehouse's environmental conditions for long-term monitoring. The reasoning here is that even with a very sound rationale of hot spot and cold spot monitoring, you do not want too much space between sensors as it is obvious uh, to us and auditors that things can change during the life of a warehouse that can impact the conditions within especially as HVAC systems age or undergo changes. Now, earlier I said that it was common to have one sensor for an upright or a walk-in storage chamber, um, but you could certainly improve on that, and that's actually the first best practice that uh, we'll be getting into. John, would you speak to that one? Sure. So in, the, in this case here, we have um, we've done, uh, I have done a number of seminars and processes and, and work with a number of companies throughout the country to be able to follow these uh, uh, best practices. And in, and in a, a short summary, uh, as I'm gonna walk through, uh, I grade things, kind of like when I was in uh, parochial school. I didn't like it, but I did get graded. And so what we have here is a grading system. So what I decided, what we decided was a D grade. It's not failing. Failing is nobody monitored. You didn't monitor anything, okay? So a D grade, you place one probe anywhere, okay, in the chamber which is a minimum acceptable practice for non-GMP. Let's face it, it could be food, it could be pharmaceutical. You put it in there, it could be R&D. You know, you monitor it. The second, you know, so it's a task of failure. 
So then you have a, a, a C, which is a good practice, okay, which is GMP. This is what the lion's share of the industry has been doing forever. Okay, and that is to put, put a probe somewhere in the chamber, whatever, and then it notifies you. It is calibrated. The logic is they'll have their own logic, put it by the controller, put it by the recorder, put it by the, the, the inlet, the outlet, whatever. They've come up with some sort of logic reasons they put it in, and if they're consistent, life is good. That's a good practice. Okay. When it goes out of spec, it tells you it's out of spec. And at that point, you know, you're you're in you're in deep trouble, you're jumping through hoops trying to solve. And then what we have is the what's called the B, the B practice. It, it, it's a acceptable, very good practice, okay? And that's GMP plus, I say. And what it is is you put one probe strategically placed in the chamber based on good engineering judgment. Let's face it, if you had to validate the chamber and map, okay, you look at the data, analyze it, and if it's the mean temperature or average, if you want to call it, depending on what, what calculation you utilize, you can put one probe in that location, right? So if it's a two-day refrigerator, my guess is you'll find somebody that's amongst all of those calculations that's sitting somewhere around five degrees. That's what you want to have. You want to have it in the middle, the mean point, mean temperature of the of the high and low. So that is your record at the end of the day. So that's great. It'll notify users when the chamber's out of specification, obviously, but there's no time to react. It's a crisis mode. And then you have to move the product and, you know, deviation reports and you have to determine you know was it out was it acceptable the amount of time yeah all that that's that's what happens but that's a really good bit of practice then we call the a practice this is what we we promote to a lot of clients you know maybe not on everyone if they choose but on high value high volume critical things usually let's, let's talk walk-ins okay a reach in can have very valuable stuff from stability and, and research and, and uh, poor product you know, storage, production, what have you, you know, and there's high value in there. But I'm just going to say, let's look at high value, large volume, you know, you, know, you can't recover from. So in that case, we, we call it the A practice, the best practice. In that case there, we have the GMP, which is what we talked about, plus performance. So we mimic the same thing we did in that in the earlier one. You put one probe where the validation says it's mean, but then what you do is you'll analyze the data and you put another temp temperature sensor in what would be called the warmer sensor that you ran, that you noticed during the study. So in a case on a walk-in where you may have an empty chamber and a loaded chamber that you qualify, you have an A system, okay, that compressor or what have you. You may have a B system compressor. You may also have in a freezer, an, it's an alternate C system, which might be LN2. So you may have six studies or four studies or two studies, you know, and what you want to do is you want to look at those and say, well, what was the hottest I ever saw during the study? What's the coldest I ever saw during the study? And monitor those points. That's two additional probes. Now for us in the GMP and sector versus non-GMP, I'm just going to say those two additional probes, you know, you don't have to be a qualified validated because what they, we're considering them is performance alert. It says, hey, listen, it was acting a little bit, it was acting in an extreme condition because we've already done our testing, and it's gone a little bit warmer, a little bit colder, and what it does is it alerts you and says something's different. Now, if it's during the workday, people are putting product in, taking product out, you notice that. You say, oh, okay. But what happens is what's really critical, if you have alternate A and B systems, you want to be notified by this performance alert before your alternate system kicks in and, 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 and helps recover prior to going out of spec. Why? Lessons learned. Uh, many companies, they don't have any performance alerts. What they have is this system ran, it's, it's going out of spec, maybe you've lost Freon, something's not recovering. The second system came in, recovered, brought you back in the spec, everything like is good. You don't know there's a failure in the first system. So utilize these sensors, these performance alerts, life is fast. It's, it's just, it just saves you. And again, they don't have to be the GM part of it, GMP part of it. Maybe you can extend the calibration interval so it's not as, 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 um, as, as uh, often, but it's another. And the last, the last is, again, 
is the uh, is taking is is considered the ultimate best practice. I could give it an A plus, and I reutilize the, the B practice, performance plus practice, or those performance alerts, and then what it is is it's a little. Bit, it takes the sensors and you put it into the heart of the system. Okay? It may be 11 probes, depending on the refrigeration system. It might be a refrigerator. It could be a stability chamber that has that steam for your generators or, or so. And what you do is you put six temperatures throughout the refrigeration system. You know, maybe measure your suction, discharge, gas bypass, all these technical terms that refrigeration people know, people in stability, people in operations, just want the chamber to work. You work with the, the specialist, the refrigeration, the engineering facility to say, this is what I want, you, place this in, you put this in place. And what it's doing is it's performing, looking at the data, and so that's happening. So the beauty of this is, this will let you know what happens if it fails immediately. All these other things, right? The A, B, C, D practice, if something fails, you'll have, as you go down the, the, the alphabet, you'll have less time so you get down to the D practice when it finally lets you know. That's and right. This, John, uh, I'll mm -hmm. step in there actually, because that's a perfect segue into uh, the concept of uh, proactive versus reactive monitoring. What John was just saying there is by intelligently putting sensors on a system, a high value system, you can get that much more time, be it hours, minutes, uh, weeks, or even months we've seen, and that time is extremely valuable because if you're reacting to something, um, you have a temperature excursion, you have a problem on your hands. People are making hasty decisions and uh, with not a lot of data and the clock is ticking to when you need to get your product into a different chamber or it's being thrown out or worse. Um, and that type of a situation can be quite critical because losing that much product could not only be devastating financially for a company, especially a smaller R&D company, but it could be damaging to reputation as well if orders can't be fulfilled or people can't get the medicines that they rely on. So building on what John was saying, by putting sensors on critical systems, you could develop an EKG essentially of what a system is supposed to look like. And as a brief example, I have my favorite case study here. What you're seeing on the screen is actually a compressor system for a 5C chamber. And we've put sensors, temperature sensors, um, around the system on, on areas of the well, the piping really, and the valves that are high risk areas, common indicators of an impending failure. And what you see on the top is that light blue line. It's supposed to be getting to a maximum of around 55, 60 degrees, but you'll see that uh, at some days it was actually getting to almost 100 Celsius, uh, dangerous temperatures. And the most amazing thing about this is that the purple line on the bottom, that's the 5C, that's the chamber temperature. And you'll see that that chamber was perfectly staying within spec of its two to eight C, and nobody would have an indication that hot gas is being ran through the compressor um, at 100 C when it's not supposed to. The actual failure that was detected here is when the when the system was supposed to shut off um, to let the the redundant system take over for the next eight hours or so. The hot gas valve, instead of closing, was saying open, and it was sending hot gas throughout the system. Um, for the entire duration that was supposed to be relaxing. That's the type of thing that could be detected that would end up being a disastrous failure because that, that system would have just failed permanently. And uh, then you're running on one system or no systems to maintain your storage. That's my favorite case study. Uh, and it's quite powerful to see how that type of an early warning, all it was is changing out a valve because we were detecting that type of stuff. So that proactive monitoring is much better when you can do it than simply reacting to out of spec situations. Uh, next, we'll talk about alarm management. And uh, Alan, could you could you do that one? Thanks, George. Yeah, let's talk about alarm configuration. How you set up alarms for you monitoring system has a massive and far reaching impact on operations at your site. This is seldom considered as much as it should be. Intelligence, intelligent use of a system alarm capability can hugely increase product and consumer safety or conversely practically invalidate the point of monitoring in the first place. We'll go over a couple of topics on this subject. Alarm fatigue. Alarm fatigue is kind of like the check engine light in your car that doesn't go off and you keep on driving for miles and miles. So that's kind of like the layman's terms. 
the most insidious of monitoring systems killers. Alarm fatigue is the much discussed situation where sensors or more commonly alarms are poorly set up and force your staff into a boy who cried wolf scenario. If your system is generating far more nuisance alarms than real alarms, your staff will start to ignore alarms simply because they do not know which to believe. When a real problem occurs, it has a much higher chance of being addressed too slowly or not at all. At that point, your monitoring system simply serves as a record of unnecessary excursions with a slow response, which isn't the best look in front of an auditor. There are, of course, ways to address this. Another topic for alarm configuration is delays. First is through the use of delays. Modern monitoring systems should have delays that can be added and customized for each alarm condition. By adding a delay, which extends the time a sensor must see an out of tolerance condition before it activates an alarm, you can reduce nuisance alarms and have real alarms generated that are much more grounded in reality when it comes to protecting your product. Obviously, product will not be damaged when having the door to a chamber open for a little bit. All right. Thank you, Alan. And uh, mm -hmm. John, we're at 45 minutes. So to save time for some questions, would you touch on buffers and alarm strategy and uh, hierarchy sure. real quick? Yep. So in, and so as, as uh, we were talking about, Alan was talking about the alarm delays. So you can do it electronically or which which you, you can't have because that's in your protocol. But what you can do is you can put a sensor, you put a damper on it. it might be a small volume of, 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 of uh, paraffin wax, beads, flash beads, what have you. And it helps, in, it helps in those nuisance alarms. And that's something that you can actually test it, check it, figure it out, you know, and determine, uh, or ask SMEs what their recommendations are, and then you can, you can utilize that. The other is the, on the alarm hierarchy. Again, lessons learned over many, many years is that we hear in the industry failures that have happened. You know, there's a single point of failure. Let's say I got the alarm call that says I'm supposed to, you know, react to this alarm condition. Well, if I'm the only one on the on the tree, the, the the hierarchy list, okay, I have to acknowledge it, and then I go away. Frequently, you want to look into this. Frequently, that's it, and it's waiting for me to go in, solve it, figure it out, create a report or a note, and say yeah, it's been solved. We all are doing multitasking in our life, and sometimes things get we get distracted, and so what happens is you acknowledge it and you maybe didn't get there in time or you got distracted or maybe uh, something happened. And we have history of a number of companies have lost things as small as one chamber's worth in Cambridge, there was one lost $3 million to other products that had problems where it notified, but it didn't notify enough people. So what I'm gonna recommend and suggest, you can still have people on call, it calls them, but it's in, in, in a task in a, in a line line item uh, 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 hierarchy. However, you should still have somebody as a responsible party that's also called in parallel. And so when the first person responds, resolves it, what have you, the second person still gets to notice that stuff's happening and they're waiting on the edge of the chair to hear what the resolution or the solution is as things go up. That way there, it's two parties. And in GMP, you always have two parties, but sometimes in the alarm hierarchy, they miss out on that. So just a, a good recommendation. Thank you, John. And um, finally, conclusions, recommendations, really. Um, I hope people who tuned in to learn something. Obviously, we here at Massey live in the monitoring world and uh, know the ins and outs of it. We use it ourselves, of course, all the time. I've been doing so for quite a while, uh, from you know chart recorders to wired systems to wireless, and now to the revolution of uh, Internet of Things and cloud monitoring. Um, so hopefully this was thought-provoking and uh, maybe got some questions going in your head. And uh, when it comes to evaluating monitoring systems, uh, I hope that there was a couple tips and tricks in there that you might find useful when you're on your search. And uh, finally, um, please ask questions. If anyone has any questions, please shoot. We have a little bit of time. So um, yeah, that, that ends the, the uh, slides for here. Thanks, George. And I do have a few questions from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll read them to you and you can answer, or maybe someone else on your panel will be better to answer. I'll let you decide i'll read them here the first question is do you have any suggestions for reliable monitoring in transit yes uh of course um but you know like i said earlier everything revolves around your use case so knowing your use case is what's going to make the decision as to what system you need what type of monitoring you need for transport monitoring 
So if you're doing one-off infrequent critical shipments that need to be monitored, but the majority of your shipping doesn't really require that, then you might be in the market actually for a cheap disposable type logger um, to accommodate that one-off type situation. Now, if you are using, um, well, if you're doing a lot of supply chain shipments that all need to be monitored quite frequently, especially between known locations, known point A's, point B's, then you have the opportunity to advance onto a, a more complex monitoring system, which is an electronic system. Um, that's where you can actually see some real savings because obviously disposable loggers uh, can rack up costs even worse than batteries where, like I was talking about earlier. Um, if you can find a system that has reusable loggers, um, you save tons of money, uh, you get more reliability, and one of the skeletons of the closet too about disposable loggers is you don't have any closeout cows. So if you're interested in making sure that your data for your supply chain, which is just as important as when it's being stored at your facility, uh, is correctly bracketed and known to be correct um, from point A to point B for throughout the duration of its life, then a reusable electronic system is really the, the way to go in that scenario. Great. Um, I have another question. What are your thoughts on using monitoring devices as a predictive system? Yeah. Um, so it's if you could do it, it's worth it. Um, because like John just mentioned earlier, there's there's been some failures that have made it to the news. There's been a lot more that don't make it to news, I'm sure, where millions of dollars in product is, is destroyed. Um, and well, yeah, that's not good. So if you can employ monitoring systems in a way that actually gives you that much, like I said, days, hours, weeks, for instance, uh, and you avoid those problems, it's much better to be on the offensive for uh, responding to things rather than the defensive. Right, and some of the techniques, that, the tips that we brought up would be helpful. So if you have an existing system already in place, whether it be wired or wireless or what have you, you know, you can actually consider expanding what you currently have to be able to put it into those key critical locations that'll give you some information to, 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 to decide and, and as john said it could be months in advance notice so utilize the assets that you've already invested in or consider something new if your systems can't do that great okay and i know you touched on this a little bit earlier george but um the next question is, what is your take on the security of a cloud-based monitoring system? Right. Um, and Well, that's a very important question, obviously, with, with cloud being newer. Um, you, you can't quite rely on just the, the comfort, which is kind of a, a false comfort, of having your system behind your own walls. Um, obviously, in today's day and age, huge companies, you need the internet and they need cloud services and uh, they wouldn't be using it if it wasn't secure. So if you can rely on a storage provider or a cloud service provider that's using one of the big names like Microsoft or, or Amazon, um, then I like to say that if Microsoft isn't doing it right, then nobody is. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so make sure, ask, ask the company that's providing the cloud system um, if they've done penetration testing. Have they had a third party come and actually verify that their system is secure? If it passes all the checks, then you, you can, at, at that point, you can quite comfortably take advantage of the huge benefits that a cloud system can offer. Great, okay, um, that's all I have. Elisa, I'll hand it over to you. I think that's all for today. Great. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and thank our three panelists who gave us some great information on monitoring. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available and sent to all attendees uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours. So keep a lookout for that. And uh, we hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.